What's up guys, Michael here to talk about a bunch of <laughs> That's right, Rugrats, one of Nickelodeon's most beloved 90s shows. And sure, the antics of Tommy and the gang are endearing, but when it comes to overthinking a kid's show, one thing really stood out to us, their parents. That's because if we do the very complicated arithmetic, these 90s parents are the embodiment of the internet's favorite object of ridicule, boomers. What's more, they're boomers raising millennial children, even if the little tykes weren't called that yet. And once you start to think about the show from that perspective, a certain shift in meaning occurs. Because what if we can understand a generation of people obsessed with anxiety memes and what Harry Potter house they belong to through the story of their parents? Let us explain in this wisecrack edition on Rugrats and the rise of boomer parents. And now for the briefest of recaps. Rugrats, as you know, spotlights a playgroup of babies and toddlers. The core original group consists of Tommy, the idealistic leader, Chucky, the perpetual worrywart, Phil and Lil, the warm love and sweeties, and Angelica, the bratty bully. When their parents leave the room, their imaginations go wild, leading them on many fanciful, occasionally horrifying adventures. For context, Rugrats debuted in 1991, and while the 80s and 90s are often remembered as a time of relative prosperity, it also was a time of widening economic inequality and a rapidly shrinking middle class. As a result, many baby boomers entered full-on adulthood slash parenthood in a state of very real economic anxiety. They were faced with demanding mortgage payments, stagnating wages, and an unraveling social safety net, which to be fair, all still are things today. These anxieties manifest in the pickles, particularly in the early seasons. Dee constantly worries about money, saying things like, I've been going over our bills, Stu, and I thought maybe if you got a job outside the house. She even grocery shops with a calculator to avoid an unexpectedly high tab. And don't forget the calculator, Pop. And we're on a budget, remember? Here, Dee Dee reflects the reality of being a boomer during this era, a reality described by journalist Anne Helen Peterson's book, Can't Even, How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation. Peterson looks at the plight of the stressed out millennials, starting with the trajectory of their boomer parents. Born between 1946 and 1964, baby boomers entered the world during the relative prosperity of the post-war economic boom. America had a robust social safety net and middle-class workers could generally rely on the support of labor unions. For those greatest generation parents, even a blue collar union job promised middle class glory, along with the ability to buy a house and provide for your family, including your crying boomer baby. As scholar Lewis Hyman put it, capitalism worked for nearly everyone. But over the course of the next several decades, the rise of what political scientist Jacob Hacker calls the personal responsibility crusade remolded American culture into one where, increasingly, people were left on their own to succeed or fail, without the help of GI bills, generous social security checks, or a good union job. As a result, boomers became grown-ups in increasingly uncertain economic times, when maintaining a middle-class lifestyle was becoming harder and harder. And for some people, that worked out really, really well, especially if you had no moral qualms about selling junk stocks on Wall Street. Greed is right. Greed works. And for everyone else, it was a huge bummer. One that Rugrats may have accidentally documented in cartoon form. For example, Tommy's dad, Stu, faces the constant pressure of operating a small business in a ruthless economy. Stu, honey, I'm worried about you. I think you've been working too hard lately. The pressure Stu faces manifests physically. He'll sleepwalk or be caught talking to himself in a state of overexhaustion. In one episode, Tommy fancifully wonders if his dad is secretly a robot, and Stu's stress induced sleepwalking confirms his fears. Here we see Tommy accurately perceiving the way economic anxiety weighs on his father. At another point, Chucky similarly relays his father's own concerns. I've always heard my daddy say he's afraid the boss is gonna fire him. So what happened as baby boomers adjusted to a new, more cutthroat normal? As Peterson describes it, the generation of weed token hippie protesters evolved from being more socially minded agitators to becoming increasingly insular. Or as economist Matthias Dupka and Fabrizio Zilabadi put it, they decided to look out for themselves. They invested more in their education and individual success while deeming social protection less important. Anyone who's seen Rugrats could perceive this cutthroat mentality in the character of Angelica's mom, Charlotte, the incessantly cell phone chatting businesswoman and CEO of the very ominous sounding Megacorp. Charlotte's known for saying things like, The junk bond market is coming back and I, for one, intend to be in a position to take advantage of it. Her selfishness, while played for laughs, actually just exaggerates a very real social and cultural shift that took place in the hearts and minds of many non-cartoon boomers long before you were telling them, Old ladies suck. Okay. 
Now, as boomers became increasingly focused on the self and keeping that self economically, socially, and physically successful, they were vying to maintain middle class status. This new mentality resulted in the rise of the yuppie, that is, the special brand of college educated boomer who, according to Peterson, can basically be defined by their lavish consumption habits, their gadgets or vacations or French sparkling wine. Also, Quaaludes. According to Peterson, the yuppie mentality took form over the course of the 70s, metastasized in the 80s, and became the base temperature of the 90s. And make no mistake, the Rugrats parents may be some of the yuppiest yuppies ever to yuppie, as the LA Times noted in a 1998 review of the show. Particularly in early seasons, the parents are hyper-concerned with projecting prosperity. A puppet show for one-year-olds? Why, the little sprats aren't even gonna remember it. They'll remember this one, Pop, rated number one by Birthdays Magazine. And besides, do we want to be remembered as the family that settled for less? They are super consumption happy, lusting after boats and fancy golf clubs. They film their banal vacations on their camcorders. There's Dee Dee packing for our vacation to the Grand Canyon. Oh, it's gonna be a long night. And obsess over health food. Don't order them any junk food or or I'll take your teeth away. They take their hobby seriously and present their new neighbors with decorative jello molds and throw nightmare-inducing costume parties galore. Occasionally, they even rent limo buses to show off for their friends. We've even rented a limo bus to celebrate Stu's big night. Of course, there are moments of reprieve from their yuppiness. The dueling realities of the boomer identity between flower child and sharper image loving yuppie comes to a head in the second season when the pickles throw a garage sale to reduce bloated clutter of commodities like You got your fondue set, your basic lava lamp from that old standby, the pet rock. The children, trying to be helpful, move all the beloved belongings that the parents chose not to sell outside, and the family ends up accidentally accidentally pawning off everything they own. After a brief moment of panic upon seeing their empty house, the pickles go full circle, almost as if retreating to the anti-consumption ideals of the 60s, at least temporarily. I mean, all we lost were material possessions. And what we've rediscovered are the important things, like family and love and other real human values. Hell, they even sing, Kumbaya, my lord. But for the most part, they stay in character. Put a sock in it, dude. <gasps> but what else did boomer yuppies do? According to Peterson, surrounded by perceived threats and growing uncertainty, middle class boomers doubled down on what they could try to control their children. And indeed, nothing made boomers more crazy than the pressure to be good parents and provide well for their spawn. Early on, the show sets this tone pretty clearly, as Dee Dee panics over throwing the perfect first birthday party for Tommy, complete with a puppet show that no one-year-old deserves. Betty, my future as a mother depends on this party, and the party depends on the puppet show. Contrast her approach with Tommy's greatest generation grandpa, who was raised and became a parent in a more hands-off age. Why, when I was a spud, we didn't have puppet shows. If we wanted to entertainment, we went out back and pulled up stumps. After the puppet show fails, Dee Dee frets that Wait, I never live up to being the kind of mother I want to be. You know, like those moms on TV. Here, Dee Dee reflects the nearly omnipresent desire among boomers to be a model parent and to perform that good parenthood for the whole neighborhood. She, like many a millennial parent who would come after her, internalized a stress-inducing message that, as sociologist Sharon Hayes put it, the methods of appropriate child rearing are construed as child-centered, expert-guided, emotionally absorbing, labor-intensive, and financially expensive. This pressure is encapsulated by Dee Dee's realization a few seasons later that she had abandoned her work on Dill's baby book, forever losing the chance to memorialize the first time he burped or pooped his pants. Better haul out the baby book and write that down! Woo-wee! <laughs> Again, she feels like she's failed. At the same time boomers worried about their child raising methods, they became fixated on what sociologist Annette Leroux calls concerted cultivation. That is, the process of carefully developing their children via cello lessons, expensive summer camps, and ensuring that they're trilingual by the age of 10. But given the persistent economic anxiety that permeated the era, these choices start to make more sense. It was all in the pursuit of their desire to raise children who would maintain their middle class status. If if they failed, they feared their kids would grow up to be the lowly garbage collector who keeps our neighborhoods clean rather than getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to do whatever the f a consultant does. As Peterson puts it, the child's well-being and more importantly, their future capacity for success is paramount. Dee Dee can barely get through a sentence without referring to her favorite child expert. Yep, she knows best, too. She obsesses over the minutia of how she rears Tommy. Diapers, wipies, books, blankets, a cap, a change of clothes, band-aids in case of emergency, and two extra <laughs> bottles of juice. 
and takes him to maximum security daycare. The parents panic over bottle feeding. Uh, this boy, his parents didn't think it was important to wean him. This child, well, you get my point. They panic over runny noses. I've tried everything, decongestants, herbal remedies, chanting. And boy, do they panic over potty training, with Chucky's dad even fretting that he's going to be taking diapers to work with him in his briefcase. Here, Chaz is literally worrying about how his failure to potty train Chucky in a timely manner could be a threat to the mini ginger's career and therefore middle class status. The boomer need to carefully cultivate their child is best exemplified in an episode when Angel Angelica takes up painting for a very yuppie reason. My personal shaman said it was absolutely the best way to nurture her creative side. Immediately, her mother praises her work, saying, I love it! What? The total abandonment of form, the disregard of balance. It's so Jackson Pollock. Little does she know that this, um, abstract expressionism is actually the result of the babies fooling around with paint. That's a nice touch which maintains the Rugrats maxim that the best things happen when kids are just allowed to be kids. It's worth noting that concerted cultivation also makes a prominent appearance in a Rugrats all grown up episode when the kids panic over a fifth grade standardized test. <laughs> Meanwhile, Angelica's mom urges her to start worrying about her college resume, giving her 11-year-old daughter totally normal advice, like, You must do things that'll impress the college admissions office. Show concern for the environment, your fellow man. The grand result of concerted cultivation was, as Peterson puts it, that boomers raised many adults, millennials who quickly grew up and began mimicking the habits of adulthood. Cue excessive anxiety. Fittingly, the Rugrats are many adults in a lot of ways, worried about living up to expectations. What? Wanna go play in the sandbox? I can't, Chucky. Oh, my daddy went away, and I wants me to be the man of the house. And worried like their parents about their own child development. When is he gonna be a big baby anyway? Also fittingly, they're prone to suffering from real bouts of anxiety, sometimes sounding like they have the weight of the world on their shoulders. Life is so hard, Tommy. Angelica, for one, becomes an expert at performing her parents' expectations of a perfect childhood. What difference does it make who did what? The important thing is that we're all here and we love each other. After all, family is really what matters, right? <laughs> Of course, she simultaneously develops a low-key, diabolical alter ego that allows her to vent her pent-up anger and frustration in the playpen. At the same time, she seems to innately have picked up her mother's love of luxurious consumption, a hankering best displayed when she harasses a mall Santa until he quits his job. So were the Rugrats always doomed to grow into the anxious, depressed, burned out millennials that Peterson analyzes in her book? Maybe? But we wonder if their fate was really set in stone, and for one main reason. The same reason that makes Rugrats so fun to watch. Unlike a lot of boomers, the Rugrats folks are way too self-absorbed to be true helicopter parents. That is to say, their patented parenting move is to put the kids in the playpen and F the hell off. This was perhaps out of narrative necessity. A show about babies sitting on their parents' laps listening to classical music while learning to read at age two and a half is a lot less fun than a show about kids wreaking havoc while imagining themselves in outer space. As a result, the Rugrats get plenty of time to themselves, away from their parents' neuroses and paranoias. Time to play, time to dream. And that's something a lot of middle-class millennial kids didn't get much of. Peterson notes that working-class millennial children whose working parents didn't have the luxury of videotaping their every burp often had a lot more free reign. That meant more of what she calls natural growth, or the conscious or unconscious allotment of unstructured time, which allows children to cultivate curiosity, independence, and learn to negotiate peer dynamics on their own. Inadvertently, perhaps, and despite their very real anxiety and neuroses about raising their children right, the rug Rugrats' parents give them a lot of this unstructured time to do the important things, like imagine themselves as pirates. This kind of play, according to Peterson, helps kids develop independence and a strong sense of self. It also makes for damn good television. 
At the end of the day, Rugrats is fascinating for its depiction of Boomer parenting, while also strategically leaving out one all-important tactic of Boomer parents. As Peterson puts it, constant surveillance and protected childhood. We think that may be part of the broad appeal of the show. At a time when kids increasingly had less license to goof around, watching TV kids go on adventures reminiscent of a different era was extraordinarily appealing. Perhaps there was some catharsis. We might not have been allowed to play outside unsupervised, but we got to watch the Rugrats build their own Noah's Ark in complete freedom. But what do you guys think? Are the Rugrats parents exemplary boomer parents? Would these lumpy babies have grown up to be depressed millennials memeing their way through our current hellscape? Let us know in the comments. A huge thanks to our current patrons for supporting the channel and a hello to our new ones. Check us out at patreon.com slash wisecrack for ad-free videos and more. And before you go, don't forget to pat that subscribe button real soft like it's the head of your overprotected five-year-old self. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.